the keto pro rich welcome to the keto camp podcast my friend thank you very much great to be here yeah great to have you here i'm grateful that we connected uh we had a zoom chat for about 30 minutes i got familiar with a lot of the cool things you're doing in the uk the uk needs your work as you know you uh you guys are way behind the scene when it comes to yeah. keto and biohacking we'll talk about why that is and the things you're doing to fix that but also your story is very relatable and inspirational i mean you were going through a lot of challenges and i'd love to go back there being obese and all the things you're dealing with so let's go back there to that point of life at that point in your life and what were some of the challenges you were dealing with rich brilliant you know it um that's a time in my life that i um i should really put behind me i forget all about but you know it <laughs> um yeah i guess it, it is um uh it, it can be inspirational to others and it, it uh, um there's nothing special about me or anybody that i work with um i'm not genetically gifted and uh, in my mid to late 20s, I was clinically obese. I was diabetic. I suffered with chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, arthritic pains. Uh, the worst thing for me were my debilitating migraines that would make me blind, um, for which I was on wow. three different types of medication for. Uh, they would come on all of a sudden. And if I didn't catch them in time, I would be bedridden for three plus days. So they were absolutely de debilitating. Oh. Um, anxiety and depression uh, i left school um quite lean at, at around seven stone so I, it, it wasn't uh, at least i believed in my genetics to be obese um although every member of my family had some sort of metabolic issue not that i understood that at the time um but i i soon put a lot of weight on uh, after I left school. Uh, in fact, I over doubled my body weight and went up to about 17 stone. So my body fat percentage was uh, between sort of 50 and 60%. Um, I had trouble wow. walking up the stairs. Yeah. So it, um, I would be uh, fatigued. I would be out of breath. Uh, I would have to stop halfway walking up the stairs. Um, and, you know, do, do you know, one of the worst things for me was the, the anxiety. Uh, almost um, never feeling worthy of the company of others. So it would quite often um, lead me to be uh, unable to leave my house. So what I used to do is I used to put myself into these little comfort zones. So my house would be a comfort zone. My car would be a comfort zone. My office in my work would be a comfort zone. And I would very rarely come out of, of these comfort zones. Um, and quite often my car, which was two feet away from my front door on my drive, I would be unable to walk to if there was another person walking in the street or if there was a car driving past. Um, and I, th I think people used to uh, believe that I was maybe unsociable uh, or possibly a little mm -hmm. stuck up. Um, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It was always a case of never feeling the worthy of the company of others. Um, I never felt good enough to be around other people and to you know, stop people in the street and speak to people. Um, and I think as many of us do, I just put this down to a fact of life. I put it down to getting older, despite being in my mid twenties. Um, you know, yeah. um, it, yeah, I, I, I put it down to, yeah, age and it's, you know, it, it saddens me now when I look back and think that uh, I actually believed in my mid twenties that life was, you know, was, was, was a downhill, uh, slope from there on in, um, I, you just thought it was like your genetics. It was just, yeah. you thought it was just a bad gene, right? Yes. And do you know, every one of my friends around me, all of the people that I was in school with, they had um, similar physiques. You know, they were uh, getting chunky around the midsection. Um, they were physically unfit. Um, you know, they'd be out drinking. And I just thought this is what life is. You know, these people who were fit and healthy were a different breed, you know, and it was something to me that was unattainable. And I, I tried. I did try. I went through spells of eating unhealthy, um, you know, which I put my hand up to. We all do. But I did go through spells of actively trying to eat healthy. I ate from the food pyramid. Um, I ate my whole grains. I consumed my seed oils and um, I became more unwell. You know, so doing the things that um, that we are told to do, uh, and there's five things in particular that that I believe um, are detrimental to our health. 
uh, five things that we are told by, you know, mainstream media that are good for us. You know, we're told to consume our whole grains. We're told to consume our seed oils. Uh, we're told to avoid uh, red meat. We're told, you know, to lower our cholesterol and we're told to avoid sodium. Now, those five things I believe to be the opposite to what we should be doing, but I practiced them. I did everything that I was told by my doctor uh, and all it seemed to do to me was make me even more unwell. Uh, I gained even more weight and I became even more depressed. Um, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea. I tried everything there is to try. I tried every diet and lifestyle you can think of. Um, and I came back to bread. I knew the bread bloated me and I knew the bread made me feel uncomfortable. So I, I thought to myself, look, look if, if I can restrict bread and at least have uh, this sense of uh, a reduce, uh, reduced swelling or reduced bloating in my belly, that it would at least give the impression that I had lost some weight. With no intention of losing any weight whatsoever, it was more to do with perception. I thought if I can lower my belly and, and get my chest a little bit pr prominent, um, you know, that it would at least give the illusion that I wasn't so overweight. So I dropped bread. I, I stopped eating, eating bread. I stopped eating anything that contained bread. Uh, I stopped eating chicken nuggets. Um, I stopped eating chicken breast covered in, in breadcrumbs. Um, you know, these things that I thought were healthy. I stopped eating cereal, um, my muesli, and all of these things that I thought, you know, were good for me, I decided to, to, to quit. And within 28 days, or oh, sorry, beg your pardon, within 30 days, I had lost 28 pounds. So my belly, I wow. shrunk, lost two stone. And I wasn't dieting per se. I was making some sort of effort to eat healthy, or at least what I believed to be healthy. Um, I was still eating tumps of fruit. I was still eating lots of veg, you know, including root vegetables. Um, and I was eating the, the fruit that was uh, high on the glycemic index because I believed it was healthy for me. Uh, but still, in spite of all this, I had dropped 28 pound. And I bumped into a friend of mine um, and he said to me, uh, you know, you must, be, you must be in ketosis. And I had never heard of this word in my life. To me, I, you know, my, my reaction was, don't swear at me. You know, I, I didn't have a clue what it was. <laughs> um, it, it was a foreign word to me. And I said, you know, what, what are you talking about? And, um, and he explained a little bit, but his knowledge was still minute, you know, because th there is, um, at the time, we're going back about eight years ago, and there was very little in the way of anything to do with being ketogenic in the UK. Still, it's very much in its infancy. Um, but... I decided to test my ketones, so I got some urine test strips, um, and I was negative. So despite restricting um, what I believed to be the foods that, that were highest in carbohydrates, and yes, you know, bread is one of them, but I was still consuming those. I didn't have a, a, a complete understanding of what a carbohydrate was. I'll be honest, I didn't realize that, um, you know, these other foods are full of carbs. I didn't understand that fruit, you know, was, was, was a type of sugar. Um, so it took me another two weeks. So I went online. Uh, I did lots of research. Uh, there was lots of research from, from the States. Um, but again, there was a lot of misinformation, conflicting information. But I did the best I could. And super long story short, it took me another two weeks before I was producing ketones, before I could work out what I was doing. Um, and I'm not going to lie, it was the worst <laughs> two weeks of my life. It... Um, I I thought I was going to die. And I remember saying to my wife before I went to bed one night, um, you know, I, and this is how desperate that I was to change my life. Uh, I was so unhappy that I said to her, look, will you come and check on me in 20 minutes? Because I think I'm going to die. And <laughs> I, wow. instead of giving in and consuming some form of carbohydrate, I was determined to beat this. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand the addiction. I didn't understand what my body was going through. I just knew that I had to try to beat it. Um, and this is what I said to her. And, and I did. I went to bed. The next day, I woke up feeling like a million dollars. And that was the flick. That was the, 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 you know, the flick of the switch for me. And there has been no looking back. Um, you know, from, the, from the back of that, um, I began uh, learning uh, and educating myself in the means of, of um, uh, you know, the keto lifestyle and nutrition in general, uh, which is a minefield because a, a lot of what we are told within the nutrition world even is still mis misinformation. Um, 
I began doing keto coaching for free. And then I began uh, buying certain products from America because it was very little in, in the way of these products within the UK. Um, and I'd, be, I'd purchase them for me to use. So I'd be buying them for myself to benefit from. And I would tell these people, friends and family that I was coaching uh, about the benefits and the research that I had done into these products. So they would ask me, you know, can you get some for me? So I would buy these products at cost for them. Um, and in there, you know, the business, you know, my business was born. Um, my wife and I sold two houses that we owned outright uh, and put everything that we owned into our business uh, because I felt that I had found a secret. I felt that this secret that nobody else knew and I had to tell the world about it because this had completely changed my life. Within 12 months of adopting this, this lifestyle, uh, I had lost uh, 107 pounds. I had reversed my diabetes. Wow. Um, my anxiety and depression, instead of being all encompassing and, and over consuming, I, could, I was able to squash them down and almost put them into a ball and put them behind me. Um, I think when it comes to things like anxiety and depression, uh, I don't think you can, I don't think you can cure them, at least not in my case. But, um, and I still get bouts to this day, but I certainly wouldn't be speaking to you today uh, on a podcast. I wouldn't be doing public speaking events in front of the medical community and general public. Um, you know, I can leave my house. You know, it's, this is how um, life changing this has been for me. The things that I do, the places I go and the people that I meet, uh, my life has changed. It's done a complete 180. My energy is through the roof. My mental clarity is through the roof. My, it's every, every factor of my life has improved. Uh, and I tell everybody about this secret that I have found. And I'll, I'll stop people in the street and tell them, you know. Um, people think I'm absolutely mm -hmm. bonkers. But it's, there is so much misinformation in regards to health, well-being, and nutrition. Um, and it's, it's pumped in mainstream media. It, it, it's, it's pumped out through um, you know, the government within the UK. Um, it's pushed by doctors, despite not having any training in nutrition whatsoever. Um, and it's... It, it, it saddens me that we um, as a nation are um, so misinformed in regards to health and well-being and how easy it is to reverse, you know, the two main contributing factors to ill health, which is insulin resistance and inflammation. These are things that we can reverse so quickly, so easily and see a massive benefit from. Um, and that's what I do. It's uh, something I'm super passionate about. Um, as you can probably tell, I scream it through the rooftops. Um, and yeah, I love what I do. It's as simple as that. It's an amazing story. <laughs> it, it, yeah, no, I know. I could tell you love what you do and you're passionate about it. And um, but when was it that you had that transformation, the 107 pounds? What year was that? So that was, let me think, uh, back in, what were we, 2022? Uh, I began eight years ago. Um, so when did I begin? 2014. So that was between 2014 and 2015. Um, and then I began the business in its first element in 2016. Um, now, one of the things that I did uh, off the back of this was that I had lost all of this weight and now I had become incredibly lean. Um, but I had found that I was still building lean muscle mass despite everything that I'd ever been taught in regards to muscle building. Um, I knew that I was becoming stronger. I knew that I was building lean muscle mass. Um, so this led me down another path. I wanted to show the world how powerful this lifestyle was. Um, so I decided to enter um, a men's physique bodybuilding competition. Now, this is something wow. that was completely alien to me because um, I wouldn't speak to people in the street let alone set foot yeah. on stage in front of hundreds of people in essentially my pants to be critiqued. Um, so this was a massive thing for me. And it's still something that when I do, um, it, it's difficult. It is hard. Uh, and all of my friends and family begged me not to do it because they knew what type of person I was and they were embarrassed. Uh, they, they were worried that I was going to embarrass myself. Um, so I decided to do it anyway. Everybody thought I was going to fail. And that's one of the biggest driving factors for me is when everyone thinks that you're, you, you're going to fail. I love to pr prove people wrong. So I persevered. Uh, I trained for this event for a year. 
Um, and I did. I, I went to compete. Um, that friend of mine who told me about ketosis in the beginning came to support me. Uh, and I remember that day I was standing backstage and I was the last in the lineup. And one by one, we walked on stage and, and I came to the curtain uh, and I stopped and I didn't walk out. My legs went to jelly. Uh, I had forgotten how to walk. My legs were so heavy um, that I couldn't put one foot in front of the other. Uh, the nerves had kicked in big time. Um, and this thing came over me and I thought, I can't go out. You know, everybody was right. I'm done. Um, and this friend called me from from the crowd. Um, he cheered me on. And I thought, you know what? I've, I've told everybody that I'm doing this competition. Every single one of them has told me I'm going to fail. And this one friend of mine has come to support me. Um, so I went out, I went out, you know, because of my friend who was there. Um, and I came second, I came second in this competition. Um, and do you know what, when I hosted, yeah, I was, I was, it, it was an amateur competition. Um, but still, you know, it, um, I was up against people who had trained for these competitions for years and years and years. And I had, you know, a year of cutting and a year of building. And I was on stage competing with them. Um, when I posted pictures, something I was really proud of at the time, uh, every one of these people who was there initially to put me down um, sent me a message. I knew that you could do it. And it was like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, you were clearly there in the, you know, early on telling me not to do it. Um, and these, these kinds of people in your life are, they are black holes. These are the, these are the negative people that suck your energy so, you know, as well as changing my life, uh, you know, as far as nutrition goes, my habits, um, my, my routines, um, I have carefully selected the type of company that I keep. I only surround myself with like-minded, positive people. Uh, I find that when you do, you bounce off each other, you grow together. Uh, and I have removed the black holes. So these black holes, these negative elements of my life have been removed. Uh, and I'm happy. I love life. I love doing what I do. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it, it's all attributed to the foods that I eat and, and the life that I live. Um, something that we quite often take for granted, but food can either heal the body or it can poison the body. Um, you know, I quite often use the analogy with uh, clients that, um, you know, your, uh, your diesel car doesn't run so well on petrol. You know, if you were using the wrong fuel, your engine isn't going to work the way it should. And eventually it's going to cough and splutter and break down. Um, and this is how I live my life. I, I make sure I consume the most nutrient dense foods. More importantly, I remove the foods that are causing the biggest issue. Um, hmm. And yeah, and, and I scream it from the rooftops. I'll, um, I'll help anybody that, that uh, you know, that, that is looking to improve health and well-being. And I think education is a big part of that. It's, it's easy for someone to say, go away and eat this, go away and don't eat that. But one of the things I try to do with my clients is uh, I won't just tell them not to eat something or to eat something. I'll explain why. So they are armed with the knowledge moving forward. Excuse me. So when their friends, their family, their doctor questions them, you know, uh, why are you eating this? This is bad because of this. They are armed with the knowledge, um, you know, whether they can understand the science behind it or not they at least know that you know there is a reason for consuming this food and a reason not for, you know, to consume this. Um, and more importantly, when their doctor questions it, because my doctor um, came down on me like a ton of bricks. After reversing diabetes, mm. he said, um, you know, this is fantastic, but I still recommend that you come off the diet. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, this... Um, I have just done something that you couldn't do with medication and I've done it on zero medication. I am now medication free. I was on a myriad of medication for a number of things. How can something that makes me feel this good be detrimental to my health? Um, now, the, my doctor would tell me, my friends and family would tell me, the media was telling me. There was, there was not one person that was around me that would back up the way I was feeling uh, other than the odd bit of research that you would find online but I knew, you know, deep in my heart that something that makes me feel this good cannot be bad for me. Uh, and I persevered. And, and off the back of that, it has led me down this rabbit hole of nutrition uh, and, um, and truth seeking in regards to 
these foods that we you know consume that are detrimental to to, to our health um and as sad as it sounds, this is what I spend. My evening is spent studying clinical trials uh, and looking at re- research paper. Everyone else is watching Netflix, and and then you know there's me <laughs> head deep in in these uh, in in these papers. But it, it, I like to understand um, the you know the ins and outs. It's easy to give somebody an answer. Um, you know, it's easy to say, you know, you, you go from A to B, but I want to, I want to understand how to get there and every process in between. And I don't think that we, in the, in the type of industry that we work, we can ever know, um, everything because it's, it's, it's evolving. We're constantly learning. Uh, and what I find is that it goes beyond being a nutritionist. Suddenly you need to know about biochemistry. You know, you need to be, uh, you know, part qualified as a doctor really you know because now you know we're dealing with people who have diabetes parkinson's disease dementia alzheimer's advanced pkd cancers um you know so we uh, and, and a doctor each doctor has his own specialty and now suddenly we are coming in with this um you know with this this uh this branch uh, of nutritional advice and we need to understand what each part of, of, of this advice is going to do to this person and what effect it's going to have, you know, whether it's negative or positive. So it's difficult. And I think that we, we are never going to be in a situation where we know everything. And this is why I love connecting and speaking with people such as yourself, because I learn, I learn from your posts. You do a post on Instagram and there's, there's information in there that will spark something for me to go away. Uh, likewise with other people and, and, and other people with me, I think, within our industry, we bounce off each other and we grow in this community. We grow in this knowledge base and this community, this support network. Um, and that's something I'm really uh, excited you know, to, to be part of. So, yeah. It is very exciting, Rich. And I love your story. You know, there's, there's a lot of lessons in your story and I'm going to extract a few of them. I, I love what you shared about the people, when you make changes in your life, when you change your nutrition, you change your uh, job, whatever changes in your life, all of a sudden you have friends and family members who make these comments and remarks and, uh, you start to become a threat to them when you start to change because a couple of reasons why not that they want to harm you or want things that are bad for you. But when you change, you now point a mirror to all your friends that are not changing, right? So when you go out with them and you say, I'm not going to have the ice cream or the pizza, I'm just going to have the steak it kind of makes them feel bad in a way because they know they're not making the right choice and they want you to kind of misery loves company. So when you don't make that decision, it's like it's easier for them to drag you back down to their level than it is for them to change. That's an important lesson. We want people that are going to charge you up and support you like your friend that went to your bodybuilding show versus those who are going to tear you down. For for me, we have a lot of uh, similarities in our stories. I remember I also had um, anxiety, social anxiety. I was obese, not to the point like you were, but I was 80 pounds overweight. And I remember going to the grocery store and feeling so awkward and having so much anxiety at the checkout counter just because I felt like everybody's staring at me. What am I going to say? I don't even know how to have a conversation with a stranger. And so there's a lot of things I can relate to with your story. And then once I got healthy, once I did keto, all that went away. And like you, I'm speaking and stay on stages. I'm doing all the video content. I'm able to be around people. It's like when you focus on your health, all those symptoms that you were dealing with and diabetes is a symptom. Anxiety is a symptom. Migraines are a symptom. Those start to go away by default versus what your doctor tried to do, treating the symptom, treating the diabetes. And it's absurd that you were able to reverse your diabetes and your doctor's like, yeah, you did that, but maybe this keto thing's not for you. And one of the biggest things that I see with doctors specifically and their patients who are doing keto is the cholesterol part. And I know you love talking about cholesterol. Doctors see that total cholesterol go up with keto, which might happen. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And they're like, okay, we got to get you off keto or we got to prescribe you a statin. So let's talk about cholesterol, Rich. What have you seen with cholesterol? Why do you love cholesterol? Why is it so important? And what can we do to get a full picture here? So the keto campers listening and watching could have a better conversation with their doctor. Brilliant. So um, cholesterol is essential for life. Uh, it's imperative for cell formation, cell communication, uh, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, hormone production, which is a, you know one of the reasons why we suffer later in life. Uh, it's essential for healing. Um, the brain and the myelin sheath uh, are made of cholesterol. Uh, we can't function without it. Um, 
you know, it, it to, to be lacking cholesterol, it, it would be detrimental to our health. Um, and there's a, there's a, a massive sort of miscommunication in regards to, to cholesterol. Mine, mine is double figures. So my current cholesterol, at least last time I was tested, was 10.26. Uh, and it is predominantly LDL, um, the so-called bad cholesterol. Uh, but LDL is protective. LDL heals the body. LDL repairs the body. So uh, the liver will send out um, an LDL particle in the form of a VLDL, a very low density lipoprotein. And this will travel through the body and it will drop off its lipid cargo uh, in the same way that a passenger would, uh, sorry, a bus would do with passengers along its journey. The lipid cargo would repair and heal the body, um, gradually getting smaller and smaller in size until it becomes an LDL particle. And then it'll find its way back to the liver where it's recycled and sent out again. Perfect. Except in modern society, this isn't the case. Um, these LDL particles become glycated and oxidized. Uh, they end up causing damage in the same way that excess carbohydrates will do to the glycocalyx uh, line in the arterial wall. So the glycocalyx is the arterial wall's first line of defense. Um, when we overconsume carbohydrates, the glycocalyx is completely destroyed and it can take up to eight to 12 hours to repair. Uh, now in modern society, we are told to eat little and often. So this glycocalyx is never repairing. Um, in, in the back end, this, this um, LDL particle is, uh, is coming to repair the damage. Uh, it's finding its way into the subendothelial space where there are cells uh, called macrophages. Um, now, these macrophages will allow access to these damaged LDL particles when the liver won't. Because when these LDL particles becomes da uh, become damaged, um, the liver won't accept them back in for recycling. So each LDL particle has a receptor called an ApoB100 receptor. Um, it's one receptor, um, and if it becomes glycated through excess carbohydrates or oxidized through seed oils, the liver basically says, no, you're not coming in, and then this will circulate within the body. But these macrophages uh, in the subendothelial space will allow access to these damaged LDL particles. So it will engulf them. And, and you'll keep cramming them in until these, these macrophages grow in size until they create something called a foam cell. You know, this foam cell is the start of an atherosclerotic plaque. So yes, LDL has caused this, but it's damaged LDL. It's glycated and oxidized. Glycation is caused through excess carbohydrate consumption and uh, oxidation through excess seed oil consumption. Um, now it's important to understand that I am not anti-carbohydrate. I'm not against carbs. Uh, I just think that there is a massive lack of understanding in regards to um, the damage that excess consumption can cause. Now, if, if you are metabolically healthy, you can consume carbohydrates and you can function very well. Uh, but as a society, uh, you know, 70% of our plate is made up of, of carbohydrates. Now, all carbohydrates break down into sugar. Um, and this is a disassociation that I believe, you know, we, we are all guilty of at some point in our life. We look at carbs as being an energy source and being, um, valuable for life, um, and separate to sugar. Now, when we look at the back of a packet of, um, of anything, um, it will say total carbohydrates and then of which sugars. And we look at that of which sugars and think, oh, you know, there's 80 grams of carbs, but only five sugar. So that's fine all of those carbohydrates will sugar eventually. Um, that of which sugars is of which is turned into glucose immediately. The rest is stored as glycogen, but it will, it will ultimately turn to glucose eventually. So every one of those carbohydrates will sugar eventually. So all carbohydrates equal sugar. Now it's this excess carbohydrate consumption. Uh, yeah, and that includes your muesli. Um, this includes you know, your breads, your pastas, your rice, uh, your potatoes. This is what's damaging um, you know, our LDL, our good LDL uh, particles uh, and, and the seed oils. So again, we, we are told um, to consume whole grains for a healthy heart. And we are, we are also told to consume seed oils for a healthy heart. Yet these are the two main contributing factors, the heart disease. Um, you know, the, these and the whole grain story, you know, we can we could go to town on this with the effect of lectins and everything else, but purely from a carbohydrate standpoint, you know, this is causing glycation. And then these, these seed, seed oils, which are meant to lower over our overall cholesterol is actually being shown to be detrimental to our health. Um, we don't want to be lowering our cholesterol. We want to be converting our LDL 
into into pattern A, a healthy LDL, and avoid it becoming pattern B, which is uh, oxidized and glycated. So the simple way to do that is reduce your carbohydrates and reduce your seed oils. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, as, as when I speak to people um, who have no interest in becoming ketogenic or going down the ketogenic route, um, I always say to them that there's, um, you know, the, the two biggest takeaways that you can, uh, or the two biggest changes that you could implement to your life is remove the grains and drop the seed oils. Now, if you can do those two things, then you are going to be a lot fitter and healthier. And your cholesterol profile, whether it rises or not, is going to be a lot better. Um, and as I say, m mine is double figures, uh, and I wish it was higher. So <laughs> the opposite to what... Um, what we are told by everybody else, yeah. um, you know, and I, and I push for a healthy cholesterol profile uh, and you'll be surprised how many clients come in to see me that um, their doctors have uh, asked them to go on statins because of their cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And when you look at their cholesterol profile, their cholesterol profile is picture perfect. And it baffles me mm -hmm. that these doctors don't understand the effects, um, you know, that, that, um, that lowering your cholesterol has, you know, within the body. The second we put our hormones out of whack, everything, everything downstream from that is affected. Um, we don't want to be messing with our hormones. So cholesterol isn't the demon that it's made out to be. Yeah, that's a great, you just did a great job explaining how that works in the body. And typically people are not even getting their LDL particles measured. They're getting a total LDL. And l let's say your total LDL is high. Okay, so what? Is that high in the large and fluffy particles, which is actually good to your point. You just explained it very well. Yeah. Or is it high in the small, sticky, oxidized LDL particles? So get the particle sizes done. Look at your HDL. Look at your triglycerides. Look at your inflammatory markers. And then you can make an educated decision. Yes. You don't have a deficiency in a statin. That's not the reason why you're at risk for heart disease. The reason you're at risk for heart disease, the two main culprits you just pointed out, Rich, seed oils, probably number one, and then That's grains, right. especially wheat, gluten. Yeah. And you're right, because a lot of people don't get and understand that just because that serving of cereal has two grams of sugar, but 18 grams of carbs, they think, I don't eat sugar, Ben. You know, it's just natural sugar. But those 18 grams of carbs will break down eventually into sugar. And I'm like you. I'm not against carbohydrates, but I am against it if you're metabolically damaged, and most people are. So yes. now we got to do the work and reset the metabolism, get into this ketogenic um, me metabolism, let the body start burning fat, lowering triglycerides, lowering inflammation, and then at some point – you could introduce carbs at some point if you're very active you could introduce carbs and you could do it the right way i teach that with keto flexing but most people have a keto deficiency that's the problem that we have so you're doing a great job explaining why it's important to get into this ketogenic state anything you want to add to that before we move on to the next topic yeah you know this um there is a formula um that this well known you know this this isn't my formula um this is touted by um uh, cardiox, uh, card, uh, cardiology specialists all over the world. Uh, and it's, an, it's a simple way to see whether your cholesterol profile is indeed damaged or, you know, pattern A or pattern B. Um, triglycerides are, are one of the biggest factors. So we want to aim for sort of less than 0.5 uh, in minimolars. Um, HDL greater than 1.5 uh, and the triglyceride to HDL ratio sort of below one, give or take. Now, if, if anything, if, you, if your cholesterol profile is around those markers, then your cholesterol profile is good and is predominantly pattern A, despite uh, on how high your total cholesterol is. As I say, total cholesterol is probably one of the biggest bluffs um, that we've ever, ever been told. Um, cholesterol, again, you know, it always bears repeating, is essential for life. Every cell in the body is made of cholesterol. Um, our brain, you know, the myelin sheath, this is how we send messages through the body. Um, and, and again, it's essential for hormone production and, and healing, um, which is something I can attest to myself uh, following an operation. Um, I saw some I was, photos um, of your injury. Yeah. <laughs> yes, quite graphic. Um, I was told a 12-week healing uh, period, and I managed to heal uh, the wound in 24 days. Um, and I put that down to my diet and lifestyle. I put it down to my cholesterol profile, and I put it down to the foods that I eat. Um, 
and I was back training soon after. And yeah, it's um, cholesterol is not the demon. It's not the demon it's made out to be. It's the grains. And, and as you rightly say, the seed oils, because seed oils uh, as a, a percentage will impact insulin resistance at a, at a greater rate than, than excess carbohydrate consumption. Um, I just think that when we look at um, means of cutting and explaining to people in basic terms, carbohydrates is probably an easier one to explain. Um, a lot of people still don't understand seed oils. Uh, and they are so difficult to get away from. Every packet in that supermarket, everything in a shiny, glossy packet, everything marked healthy, everything marked low fat contains some form of vegetable or seed oil. Um, so I think mm -hmm. the the transition to reducing carbs will probably carry more benefit to your average person rather than trying to explain to them to cut seed oils because suddenly now they go into the supermarket and now they don't know what to eat because food is this thing in, in a packet, you know? And that's not food. These things are not foods. Foods are, are the things that you can buy from your butcher and the greengrocer. These things in packets are not re real food. But this is what we are told uh, as a society. This is, you know, um, what we believe. We go into the supermarket and these, these packets... These shiny packets marked health bars are food. They are not food. You want, you know, take, remove these from your life or massively reduce. They are not serving you on a health front. Take them out. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And, and you're right. You know, if you're buying an avocado or a vegetable or a fruit or something that's a whole food, there's not even a label on there because it's just an avocado. There's no other ingredients. So that's a perfect yes. point right there. And uh, going back to what you said about the HDL and the, and the triglycerides, yeah, that's a good thing to do, get your ratio. You explain the markers for uh, in the UK. I'm going to share it. I'm going to translate it to the US. Perfect. We want to see your HDL over 60 in the US and your triglycerides under 100, but also the ratio, getting your total triglycerides, dividing it by HDL should be under 1.5 in, in the US. Perfect. So for those of you who want to make that translation, that's what we want to do. Um, you mentioned hormones are important and I, I agree, you know, we have this human body, this incredible human body and this orchestra taking place and this innate intelligence and hormones play a big role. Weight gain and weight loss resistance and obesity and diabetes, it's a hormone problem, not a calories in versus calories out problem. So you have given lectures um, all across the UK and I've seen them on your YouTube channel. And you focus in on three hormones that I want you to talk about right now and how keto actually helps these three hormones. We have insulin, we have glucagon, and we have leptin. So if you could just explain the three hormones and then how to optimize those hormones or how does keto optimize these three hormones? Perfect. So it, um, we can't store fat without insulin. Um, now, insulin is secreted by the pancreas when we consume carbohydrates, i.e. sugar. Um, so the pancreas will secrete insulin Insulin will upregulate an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, um, which breaks uh, the backbones uh, on the glycerol backbone. Um, so when we consume these foods, this increases our tri triglycerides. Um, a triglyceride can't store in a fat cell, uh, fat cell in its whole form. Um, it needs to be broken down. And it's lipoprotein lipase that does this. It breaks the backbones and it allows fatty acids to diffuse into the fat cell. And then uh, the glycerol backbone, uh, glycerol backbone will transfer into the fat cell through something called the GLUT4 transporter. Um, now, this is how we store fat. Now, when it's, when it's in the fat cell, these join back together um, and that fat is stored. Now, when we want to use these uh, fatty acids for energy, for fuel, we need to perform this in reverse. So now we need another enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. Now, hormone-sensitive lipase will break these backbones again uh, and then allow fatty acids to diffuse into the bloodstream for us to use for energy. Now, what, uh, and still a lot of my friends today will uh, consume lots of carbohydrates before they go to the gym so they have energy to burn fat, except what they don't understand, despite me explaining a million times, is when insulin is elevated, insulin is telling the body to store fat, but it puts a biological lock on the fat stores and makes it almost impossible for us to burn uh, fat for fuel. Um, so insulin has a double kick in the teeth. It doesn't just tell the body to store fat. It puts this biological lock on our fat stores and prevents it from leaving. Um, so insulin is a storing hormone uh, and it wants to store fat. 
uh, and, and the types of foods that, um, as I say, that will you know increase uh, insulin are our carbohydrates, our sugars. Um, so that's our bread, pasta, rice, potatoes. Um, and interestingly, seed oils also have an impact on insulin. So these seed oils will uh, cause insulin resistance. Um, we, as a society, look at, or within sort of our society, look at seed oils uh, in particular, um, an, uh, an oxidized omega-6 called linoleic acid. So this is what um, these vegetable and seed oils uh, are high in. It's, it's this oxidized um, uh, omega-6. Um, now, omega-6 uh, will tell the body to store fat. Um, saturated fats don't do this, and omega-3s don't do this. So these oxidized omega-6s, these, these oxidized uh, oils cause insulin resistance and tell the body to store fat. But as a double kick in the teeth, um, they also block a hormone called leptin. So leptin is a satiety hormone. Now, leptin is, is released from the body, uh, and it tells us that we've eaten, and it tells us that we're full. Um, except these vegetable and seed oils block leptin. They block the body's ability to tell us that we've eaten and block the body's ability to tell us that we're full. So the issue with this is that we're not full, so we end up consuming more food, obviously leading to further weight gain. Um, now, the interesting thing with these, um, these oxidized omega-6s or linoleic acid is it's not just linoleic acid that will cause this. It's, it's any oxidized oil. So, so we can even get oxidized omega-3s. Um, so this is why it's pertinent yep. to be careful in regards to your, um, your omega-3 uh, consumption. And I, I always advise that we take in omega-3s from natural sources. Um, try to get it from you know, your fish, your salmon, sardines, mackerel. Uh, because the second that they have been put into a capsule and, and put onto the shelf, um, they begin to oxidize over time. So it's pertinent to um, understand that it isn't just these omega sixes that ox oxidize. Uh, you know, omega threes will oxidize in the same way as well. Um, but the interesting thing with um, with leptin is that it, it, it can also be acted upon by by grains. Um, so the grains are high in um, carbohydrate binding proteins called lectins. Now these lectins, um, they bind to insulin receptors and they, they can cause up to five times more fat storage than insulin itself. So now we are not only having the effect of, uh, of insulin telling the body to store fat, but now we're getting this five times increase um, of, um, of, of these lectins. Um, now these lectins in these grains, they also block leptin. So these, these, these lectins within the grain also block the body's ability to tell us that we're full. Um, but it gets worse than this again. So when we consume food, um, these nutrients are broken down uh, and we have little fingers in our gut called microvilli. Now these microvilli are how we absorb nutrients. So these nutrients will bind to the microvilli and we will take in our vitamins and minerals, uh, except these, these lectins, um, and we're all, all familiar with uh, a lectin in the form of gluten. Um, and a lot of people will test for celiac disease, uh, but gluten isn't the only lectin, uh, arguably not the most damaging, um, but it's certainly not the only one. Uh, and you could still suffer with uh, a gluten intolerance because there's something called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which I believe to be a spectrum. I think we're all on it. Uh, it just depends on how mm -hmm. much we are affected. Um, but all of these lectins will cause intestinal permeability. So I'll explain a little bit about this now. But when these nutrients come in, these um, these lectins from these foods that we eat will bind to receptor sites on the microvilli. And instead of having all of this sort of surface area to absorb nutrients, these lectins sort of cause this. So now the surface area to absorb nutrients has been massively reduced. So now we're consuming these foods, but now we're not getting our vitamins and minerals. If we are not getting our vitamins and minerals, we eat more food. So again, all of this is leading to overconsumption. Um, but these lectins, when they bind to the microvilli um, uh, on the enterocytes line in the gut, um, so the enterocytes are a cell line in our gut, and they're one cell thick. So this, this layer is one cell thick, and this is what protects our insides against external toxins. So it's got a massive job for such a little thing. Um, but these lectins bind to these receptor sites, and when they do, they cause the release of a molecule called zonulin. Zonulin release causes a gap in the tight junction between the epithelial cells, and this allows undigested protein molecules to travel into the bloodstream, where the body sees them as a foreign invader, 
uh, and through a process called molecular mimicry, um, uh, the, the body will, will create these antibodies and start attacking other proteins in the body that look, that look the same. Um, now, this is autoimmune disease. So this is intestinal permeability, which has led to autoimmune disease. Uh, now, this is across the board. Whether you are celiac or not, if you were consuming lectins, you have intestinal permeability. Um, and that's scary because there are lots of foods out there um, that, that contain lectins, but grains in particular, you know, wheat germaglutinin, phytohemoglutinin, all of these lectins will cause intestinal permeability and lead to a whole world of unpleasantness. Um, so this is why it's pertinent to, to, to take grains out of the diet. So when we look at these grains, I mean, earlier on, we were talking all about carbohydrates. Um, now it's gone well beyond, beyond carbohydrates. Now we're talking, you know, health, intestinal permeability. Um, and, and this is something we need to keep intact. So grains uh, have, have got to go. And these seed oils have got to go, you know, and, and I can't reiterate that enough. I can't reinforce this enough. Um, th these things are uh, highly documented. Um, you know, you, you've, you've probably seen the presentations that I give and all, all of these are referenced um, and they're not difficult to find. They are there in abundance, but you'll be surprised how, may, how, how few people um, within the UK and probably the world maybe even understand the effect that these lectins are having on intestinal permeability. So it's, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's scary, you know, that this is the effect that these foods are having within our body. Yeah, you did a great, do great job again explaining that. And there was a great study that came out of Harvard a couple years ago, 2020, that, that showed all disease begins in the leaky gut. And you just explained yeah. how leaky gut intestinal permeability is created. Hippocrates, a very long time ago, he had it right. He said all disease begins in the gut. And he said that a long time ago. And now we're in 2022. Yeah. And that's exactly right. The cool thing about keto you're not going to eat these lectins. You're not going to eat grains. You're not going to eat beans. So that's a great way to eliminate them. And even on what I call a keto flex day, which is a strategic day, once you've built metabolic flexibility to incorp incorporate carbs for a day, I recommend still avoiding these um, lectins and high amounts of anti-nutrients just because it creates a lot of problems in the gut. And autoimmune disease is rampant. Um, it takes many, many years for a conventional doctor to diagnose autoimmune disease, that autoimmune disease could have started 15 years ago. And now yes. you're having all these symptoms and then you're diagnosed with it, but it started 15 years ago. And if you would have heard this conversation that me and Rich are having 15 years ago and said, all right, I'm just gonna eliminate lectins and anti-nutrients, it would have never progressed to this diagnosis. And there's over a hundred autoimmune diseases and an additional 40 to 80 connected to it. And it all boils down to the health or the unhealthiness of your gut. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, as you say there, about the sort of 10 to 15 year marker, because um, as a society, and you hit this on, on uh, you know, the nail on the, on the head earlier, um, as, uh, you know, I was going to say a nation, but a, a, as a, a world, um, we are insulin resistant. You know, we touch base on, on carbs being okay if we are metabolically flexible. Unfortunately, 95 plus percent of people are not metabolically flexible and they are insulin resistant. Now, what I get back when I speak to clients and customers initially about this is, well, I, I've been tested for diabetes. I am not diabetic. Um, but what they don't understand is the doctor in this situation is testing blood glucose levels. Now, insulin, um, the pancreas will, will upregulate the amount of insulin that's being secreted. So uh, insulin will keep blood glucose in check all along, the, all, you know, uh, all along this, this while uh, until it's unable to sort of continue to increase this production. And then it's at that point, 10 to 15 years later, that this curve uh, starts to increase on, uh, on, on the blood glucose. Now we are diagnosed with diabetes, but it began 10 to 15 years prior. Um, so... You know, there's, um, there's a simple way to test um, if you suffer with insulin resistance, and it's, it's, it's central adiposity. Um, now, if you have uh, an overhang over your belt, over your trousers, over your skirt, um, then it is quite likely that you are insulin resistant to some capacity. So it is pertinent to take that on board and try to make amends in regards to reversing insulin resistance. And this is something we can do incredibly quickly. Um, just by restricting carbohydrates, we will see a reduction in serum insulin levels almost overnight. 
Um, we have worked with clients who um, have diabetes, who have reversed their diabetes based on um, on blood tests within as little as two weeks. Um, and we can see this almost immediately. The second we restrict carbs, uh, insulin begins to, to, to drop. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it is really this simple, you know, it, um, we don't need to be on uh, a myriad of medication. We don't need to be on, um, you know, because what we find when we go down the medical route is that we take a pill for, uh, you know, a, a, a symptom, excuse me, and then we need to take another pill to counteract the side effects of the first pill. And then there's another, and before you know it, you're on five meds per day. Uh, and, you know, you you read the back of the label of the medication um, and it will say, you know, on most of them, possible risk of death. And you think, why are you putting these into your body? Um, but again, it's, it's an education piece. You know, we are told to do these things by our doctor and we put a, you know doctors on a pedestal. I work with doctors. I've got a lot of respect for them, but they are not nutritionists. They're not trained in the world of nutrition unless they have gone off on their own back and, and done the research. Uh, in regards to it. And um, they are out there. There's, um, you know, we, we had a chat last time about the public health collaboration, which I am part of. Um, and, you know, there the, are um, a whole host of doctors and nutritionists within the UK who are pushing this on a daily basis and trying to educate the rest of the medical community. But it is so difficult. It is so difficult. And one of the things that you said to me last time was that, um, you know, with you guys in the States, uh, you pay for your healthcare, so you know you, you possibly may be more proactive in, in paying attention and looking after your health um it's we have the nhs within the uk and i think a lot of people take it for granted so it's a case of it doesn't matter if i'm sick because i don't pay for it um and that i think is a mistake um i think if we had to pay for health no don't mean not the nhs is absolutely fantastic but if we had to pay for healthcare, we would be a lot more proactive in our approach to health and nutrition um, and unfortunately, it you know this, the answer isn't in um, the, you know the bottom of a medication bottle. Uh, it, it it comes to what we put in our mouth, um, and you know we can we can make these changes so so quickly, uh, and it's just a shame that um, you know as as a society uh, you know within the world we are um, misinformed on a daily basis, and it's a struggle that I know you were fighting and, and I push every day. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's when we continue to, to push, isn't it? You know, that's right. That's the mission. It's a very important mission, and conversations like this help the mission. So for those listening and watching, I encourage you to share this with somebody you know, maybe somebody you know who has diabetes, somebody who's overweight, somebody who has autoimmune disease, and that's most of the people you know, honestly, because most people are sick in the UK, in America, in the world, and we. I should say me and Rich, like he said in the beginning, we're not special. Meaning just because I I was able to become metabolically flexible, I lost 80 pounds, Rich became metabolically flexible, he reversed type 2 diabetes, he lost 107 pounds. I'm not special, Rich is not special. If you have the combination to the code, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, whether you're black, you're white, where you live. If you have the combination, you unlock the code. The combination is keto, intermittent fasting, you know, sleep, all the things that we speak about. So share the combination, you know, with your friends, share this episode with your friends, go to Rich's website. If you're in the UK, Rich has developed awesome products for those doing keto. You know, we didn't even get into a lot of things. We'll do a round two, but you have electrolytes, you have, uh, you know, BHB exogenous ketones and your website is theketopro.com. So share a little bit more about, you know, the things you do, your products and where else can they find you besides theketopro.com. Yeah, you know, the, the, the ketopro.com is um, the best protocol. There's, um, there's a little information on there. Uh, there's free guides. There is a, a video section which contains some of the, the presentations and talks that I give. Um, so that's a good place to start. We are constantly adding and building to that. Uh, on Instagram, I am keto underscore pro. Um, on Facebook, uh, I have recently started um, a new Facebook group called do you know, and I took so much time thinking about the name to call this website. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, the name for the Facebook page, sorry. Um, so I came up with Keto. <laughs> so the Facebook <laughs> page is there literally you Keto. Um, you know, it, it's plain and simple. 
but if if that's something you know we can pop a link in below that'll be fantastic it's it's a new group uh it's super supportive uh everyone's really friendly um you know people put little questions in there looking for free guidance and advice and you'll get a whole host of people who will gladly jump on and exchange recipes and we promote all aspects of healthy living um you know i'm uh, a hardcore ketonian if you like you know um a, a lot of people will regard me as being strict i don't find myself being strict because i love the foods i eat i love the lifestyle um you know, but that said, I understand that it, it can be incremental for some people. So I support dirty keto. I support low carb. I think any transition into being ketogenic and the production of beta hydroxybutyrate within the body is going to see massive health benefits for the brain, the body and the heart. So I, I promote all aspects. Um, you know, we don't criticize anybody who has a belief within the group, but I do try to educate. So, you know, people may post a recipe about something and that's fantastic. If, you know, we are taking, you know, these recipes and consuming these foods to, to maintain a journey, but I will, I will try to educate them in the means to some of the ingredients uh, and maybe highlight the fact that some of them may contain lectins or other sort of, um, uh, phytoalexins or anti-nutrients. Um, but you know, I support all aspects of, of healthy living, um, so whether you are uh, curious or not, you know, you can you can come along to the group. You can sit on the sidelines. Um, you can watch everyone else's questions and answers. You don't have to participate. But we do weekly giveaways within the group as well. So I give a product away every week um, and we do regular sort of Q&As and things in there. So it, it's, it's a good group to be a part of. Um, and that's it, really. Th those are the platforms that I'm most active on. Um, so, yeah, feel free to... Um, to, to, to sign up and check me out. Awesome, Rich. We're going to put all that down below. So if you're listening or watching on YouTube, you could find Rich's links for his Facebook group called Keto, his Instagram and his website could be found down below. And you also have a YouTube channel, which we'll put down below as well. Yes. It's a great YouTube channel. Several of your lectures are on there too. Uh, Rich, I want to acknowledge you, my friend, for living it to lead it. You know, first you went through your pain that pain turned into a purpose. And now that purpose has turned into a promise. And that promise is to educate and, you know, educate as many people as possible on this amazing metabolic state called ketosis. So thank you, my friend, for the work you're doing. We'll do a round two, definitely in the future. There's a lot more we can cover. And I look forward to seeing you in person at a, at a conference sometime in the yes. near future. For sure. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Been a pleasure. Thanks very much.